Hello and welcome to my brand new show, Untold British Asian Stories, right here on the Seek channel. I'm your host, Jaggi Sohal, and I want to start opening up the conversation about issues and topics we don't speak about in the Asian community. So in this show, we're going to be exploring what those issues are, why we don't speak about them, and what can be done to overcome and change this mentality. One person who's going to be sharing a story throughout the series is the author of this book, Not Our Daughter, The True Story of a Daughter-in-Law. The book covers a lot of issues such as domestic violence, divorce, and in this episode, we're going to be talking dowry. So I want to welcome that author to Seek Channel. Hello. Welcome, Kabir Baines. How are you? I'm okay, thank you. Yeah, and also we have with us the founder of the Sharon Project, Bolly Hara. Hi. How are you? Good, thank you. Yeah, so, so Kabir, let's start with you first of all, because we know you're an author, but you also had a different career before this, right? Yeah, I was a fashion designer, yeah. and I diverted into um, wanting to write a book. So I diverted from design to retail management and then in my own time, took the time out to write this story. Right, okay. And then Polly, can you tell us a bit about the Sharon Project? Of course. So the Sharon Project is a national charity that supports women, particularly South Asian women, who've either been disowned or at risk of being disowned due to abuse or, or persecution. So that can include things like forced marriage, honour abuse, dowry violence and a range of other issues so we're here to help them get back on their feet right okay and a couple of them issues are covered in the book aren't they yeah so first of all the book is inspired by true events yeah growing up I saw like loads of things that I just didn't agree with as well as like in my adulthood as well right. there's things that I saw and I thought I want to actually talk about them and have it as a dialogue so I chose to write about it to express the way I felt just to get somebody else to pick it up to read it to then say how they feel about things hopefully opening a dialogue between two people yeah or more, a group well, of people. I have to say like I read it and like, I don't usually read so like, I read it in under a week and it was really a gripping but kind of a hard read as well yeah so can you give us a little rundown of what the book is about it's basically looking at um, three generations if you look at it as almost like my generation, my mum's generation, a bit of my nan and my nan's generation. And it's looking at the way how things have changed within the South Asian community with weddings, costs of weddings, um, the process of Harleen and Mohinder in the book getting married, um, the complications that come with planning a big fat Punjabi wedding, the way I look at it in the book, and then also the complications of living with in-laws and what hidden secrets you discover after you've got married yeah. about each other as a couple because Overall, we don't live with our partners until we get married, and that's yeah. when you really get to know a partner. That is true. That is true, and it's in our culture, isn't it? Yeah. Just not do that, and then yeah, you discover a lot of things. And in the book, you go in a lot of detail, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to d go into so much detail so that whoever the reader is can relate to the characters and actually feel what they're going through. What actually? What moment actually inspired you to write the book? It was after I'd gone through a divorce myself. Yeah. Um, I saw the way people looked at me quite differently and it does talk about divorce. Yeah. Um, just the way when I came back home, the way family, friends, family were towards me, that I actually made a decision one day. I want to talk about these subjects that people don't want to talk about because after going through my own divorce, my brother was getting married yeah. and it was a situation where Nobody came up to me to ask me how I was. Yeah. But if anything, they were asking me indirect questions of, oh, where are your in-laws? Or how's things going? Or, you know, everything else, but how I am. And when they already know the full story, the story anyway. Yeah. So well, the just, story of their version, yeah. but not the truth. And yeah. it's sad as a community, we do that still. And that for me, because my mum, my parents are divorced and my mum went through it. So yeah. it made me think what's changed in the last 25 years to then and now. Yeah. And that's where I wanted to challenge that kind of behaviour and start talking about the subjects that we don't, we've been brought up not to talk about. Yeah, this is why this series come about, because me and you had a talk and we thought this would be a great way to kind of get it out there, really. Yeah. Was it hard, looking back at them dark times, like, was it hard to revisit? Yeah, it was actually, especially when I was sat alone in my apartment writing it. It was difficult because you're having to go through it again the second time, um, to the point where you do kind of feel like you're, you're falling deep back but then it's another way of it's therapy as well at the same time dealing with it the second time that you actually know I don't want to go back there so what am I going to do to make the changes in my own life yeah and what about your reaction of your family uh, surely you had to check with them before writing the book because obviously they feature I actually I'd met um, 
Satnam Sangera in 2011 okay, amazing. at British Library. And yeah. this is where, where I emailed him asking him just to meet for coffee and just to talk about, you know, give me some advice. And yeah. I remember him saying to me at the time, who are the people that you care about? And there was only a handful of people. And he goes, out of those people, as long as they've read it, they're happy with it. Anybody else's opinion doesn't matter. Mm. So I didn't really care about extended family. It was to me, the five people that I gave as a name, they mattered. And yeah. I had um, a cousin Mamaji check the f manuscript for me to yeah. give me feedback, to m tell me there was a chapter I had to really edit out and take out. Oh, really? Because um, he found it where it was just challenging it. I was challenging the community way too much. And he goes, I just think it can be done without that. And then when I was editing with Hardy in Coley, yeah. even he said, he goes, you don't need it because you've got so much going on in there. Yeah. So it was quite good to have that advice. Yeah. And somebody f as professional as him as well. Yeah. And the thing is, with your, your book, it is a really gripping read, but you've already, you cover so much in there yeah, anyway yeah. that there's a lot to kind of take in. Yeah. So I did more. <laughs> so there's <laughs> one chapter I did, um, had to edit down completely just to, out of respect. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad I did take that advice that he'd given me at the time. Yeah, because obviously you've got to check in with the family yeah. and stuff. Um, how has the reaction been since the release of the book? So not just from your family, but from the general public. I found where I've had a lot more, um, not just women, but men as well, reach out and give me messages, tell me about their own journeys. And that I don't know how to respond to because I can sympathise to a certain point, but I'm no trained counsellor or anyone. Yeah. And this is where... The Sharon Project kind of helps where if there's anyone saying to me that they're struggling or they need support for something, I can divert them towards the Sharon Project or any other charities that Sharon Project have recommended. And, you know, it's guiding them to the right support because all I can do is listen. Yeah. Or like, you know, kind of, I can't give anyone advice because I've myself have been through quite a lot myself. Yeah. But I suppose it's good in a positive light that your book has triggered yeah. people start opening up about their own issues. Yeah. Do you get I me? Mean? Because that starts a conversation, which is what you're aiming to do, and yeah. you as mm. well, Polly. So um, you cover a lot of topics in the book um, about that British Asians don't talk about, like abortion. Yeah. Was that a conscious decision to do that? Or? I think one of the most painful things I went through was that abortion, and I wanted to talk about it because overall, it's not just the South Asian community; it's a taboo subject in any. It is. It really is. Religion yeah. or culture, you know. Whereas though, it needs to be talked about, and if if you just look at it from a point of view where gender selection abortions have been going on for many years, but as a community, we hide it. Yeah. You know, and even if you just look at like. So overall, just for that sort of reason, they still won't talk about it. But there's people that, if you look at um, Code of Sikhism, it's forbidden to go through one um, for gender selection. But yet, you'll have people that still do it. Yeah. And it's just challenging. You know, my personal reason weren't down to gender selection. It was down to the fact that we as a couple weren't ready at the time when I was married yeah. to my ex, where we weren't ready to have a child. Yeah. But and it happens, but then there's women that it happens to that are not married. Yeah. So I think it's a dialogue, it needs to be brought about with parents to sit there and talk to their kids and sons and daughters about this yeah. and be like, if you were in that situation, how would you deal with it? Yeah. And you know, you can be living with a family and you know, your parents can't know nothing about what's going on in your own personal life. And I think that's the sad, sad part of it. And we need to get, as parents, a bit more involved. Yeah, just get the communication going. Yeah. Polly, what's your thoughts on why British Asians don't open up and like in our community in general yeah. about issues like abortion and what, what's your opinion on that? What I think um, we're getting better yeah. at talking about these issues, um, but certainly there are times when we don't talk about things like dowry and um, honour-based abuse and forced marriages and domestic violence, what happens behind closed doors, because we've been raised in this culture to believe that we're not allowed to speak out. And yeah. as a result of that, they become hidden harmful practices. And it's only when people bravely speak out about it, like Kelby has done in her book, yeah. then you start to have that conversation and people start to say, well, actually, it does happen. Yeah. And actually, we should be doing something about it. But it's starting that dialogue. And a lot of the work that we do, particularly within communities, is to respectfully, yeah. but have that conversation. It does happen. It yeah. does exist. It is happening right now somewhere in your neighbourhood so how can we address this and how can we stop it from happening but you must also understand from my point of view like I do also understand why people don't 
necessarily speak out about their issues because obviously I'm like quite a private person generally. I'd only speak to a few select friends or like if I had a, if I was going through something, I wouldn't like you know put it on social media or something like that. But I do get also while the big issues like domestic violence, like abortion, should be spoken out. But it's got to be done in a kind of right manner, right? And also have safe spaces, which that's what the Sharon Project does do when you mm -hmm. have events and stuff. There's safe spaces, there's safeguard procedures that you give to your clients to let them know where to reach out and what to do. Um, so it's handling that conversation in a tactful way. You can't be going in there very aggressively yeah. saying, you know, talk about this, talk about this. And that's the reason why I did it in a form of writing, where you write something. If somebody wants to know about it, pick it up and have that discussion, they can do. Also, like people express in different ways, where they use art, poetry, you know, it can be anything to express how they feel, but people connect to that. Yeah. And it's having that similarity of connecting and then bringing that dialogue about. But I just think now we're moving on. I wouldn't want my kids to go through what I've gone through. Yeah. So I would naturally have that conversation with my kids if I were to have children. You know, and I think it's about breaking things that we haven't done in the generation above yeah. to make, you know, to make a movement forward. Yeah. And I think you hit on a really important point about social media, yeah. right? Because this is a new age of posting absolutely everything about your life that yeah. you want the world to see, but not what's really happening. Yeah. And so, again, um, understandably, people don't want to air their dirty laundry yeah. and, and, and I understand that but if someone has been harmed if somebody has been physically sexually speak, financially yeah. or emotionally abused are we saying that it's okay not to talk about it yeah. you know because this is what happens when we don't raise this issue and whether it's through a book a film yeah. media or arts we still need to yeah. have and, and shows like yours we yeah. still need to have that conversation to say this is not acceptable yeah we can make it stop there is support available for you and actually be able to say that in itself gives that person who's experiencing that abuse to feel that a they can, strength, yeah, yeah, that yeah. bit of strength to kind of speak out. If nobody speaks up for yeah. her or for him, yeah. then she feels that, or he feels that there's no point. But yeah. if you do talk about it and people say, I will support you, I will stop this, family will step in if needs be, um, the community will turn around and say, enough now, we need to stop doing whatever it is that's been causing somebody harm. Yeah. Only then are we going to see a change in mindset. Only then are we going to see equality and, and, and gender equality at that. Yeah, no, no, 100% I agree with that, definitely. One thing in particular that was important for you to raise awareness about um, was the whole wedding process, wedding costs, dowry, um, which you cover in your book. Why these topics? I think just growing up, seeing the way weddings were, and I remember as a child having seeing all these organic weddings where it was a family getting together, the tent in the garden, you know, it was all really close knit. And then going from that to where now it's become a wedding industry, it's, you know, how much are the weddings now and at average where extortionate amount from 50,000, is it? To yeah, so an average British wedding costs around about 21,000 pounds, a typical Indian wedding or an Asian that, wedding is between fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand. Crazy, pounds. that is you know? crazy. And the uh, British Asian wedding industry is worth around three billion pounds every year. So when you've got such an importance placed on on money, on the monetary value of a wedding, yeah. it's very hard with somebody who didn't want to go through it to say no. Yeah. And all the pressure is then on that person to go ahead with the perfect wedding, even if they didn't want to, and even if there were questions or, or doubts. So it places a huge amount of pressure. So much money is thrown at weddings. But when things go wrong, there's no one there. Yeah. There's no but support. When it, when but it's also the, wedding, the divorce rate is going higher now, and then you spend that much money on a wedding, and then you get divorced, so you're right. Like It must be the pressure to building up, to living up to that. But not just thing. that, even if you look at your average salary, we probably mm. don't even earn that much as an individual. Like yeah. You've got to put a couple or three people together to have that wedding. You know, It's a joint decision, so that whole thing of like a joint family contributing for a wedding, and then it fails. And I just think it's sad that we need to, there is a bit of a movement I'm seeing where people are having smaller affairs, but it's still lavish. Mm. Yeah. there needs to be that change and I think that's the reason I chose to kind of explore and play around with the whole wedding thing and personally as well when I went through mine I found it stressful yeah so I wanted to talk about this openly and say people do go through these emotions but we choose not to and also working in retail management I've seen girls walk into my workplace at the time where I remember envying this one girl who had a dozen roses but she was having a panic attack on the day because her guest list had gone up 
Yeah. So I could sympathise with her at the same time. Yeah. And it's two weeks before the wedding. It's crazy, isn't it? And then, you know, like demands start coming in, like if, if like the boy side want this or the girl side don't want this. And the pressure that it puts on that couple, you're already setting it up to fail. Why do you think it is, though? Do you think it's a part of everyone trying to outdo each other, trying to show off to the community? Do you think that's why people are going to extremes, like even getting out loans to pay for I think weddings? that's and... certainly part of it. Yeah. I and mean, we know yeah. historically there has always been the big fat, Indian wedding, the yeah. bling comes out, that's been kept away for forever and then suddenly whose wedding can outdo your neighbour's wedding, your cousin's wedding and it is about throwing money to show how well you're doing but the reality is for many of these families they have taken out loans, yeah. they have become yeah. indebted to family members and, and quite often you know loan companies as well, yeah. they've had to remortgage several times their property or, or sell their car all for the sake of one day of showing all this wealth, which is unrealistic. And as Carpe said, the, the average earnings in this country is, is not as high as, as the demand for, and you don't need all this, this, this gold and, and lavish elect, you know, extravagance mm. in, in a wedding for one day, because when everyone goes home, it's just those two yeah. people who are left in that relationship. Exactly. Yeah. I, think, look, I think fair pay to everyone, if they want a big wedding and yeah. they can afford it, fair pay to them. But also, if they don't, you, how often do you really watch a wedding video? You watch it once, and then all that, kind of all that show for that one day, and it's probably a great day, great weekend, but then like you realise, it's just the two of them afterwards, they're left to their own devices, and then if they don't know each other that well, or haven't lived together like you mentioned yeah. earlier, it's, it could be quite daunting, couldn't it? You can it? be investing that money, even if you invest it into a property, you're still setting them up in a different way, but the fact is, it's that's what I mean, we need to see that shift. There is that bit of mm. shift starting now. Yeah. We need to see a bit more movement, I think, in the right direction. Yeah. So it was that, that I wanted to play around with it and seeing relationships in the older generation have lasted longer, but they didn't have big weddings. Yeah. And a younger generation were now having bigger weddings. Now marriages don't even last that long. I think it's just because we have more options yeah. nowadays. We're spoiled for and choice. Like, the whole app thing and the, the social media. And they had to make it work, didn't it? The older yeah. generation, they had to make it, which yeah. is quite admirable. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So do you think weddings so the girl side do tend to pay for weddings and it's still current it's changing it has changed but do you think it should be a 50 50 i think it should be a 50 50 um because at the end of the day you're both contributing towards it and it's both of your big day yeah it shouldn't be where one party has to take the grunt of the bill yeah because that's what a lot of people do but now i've seen it and i've i've got siblings that i know that had contributed 50 50 to it yeah Oh, that's good. That's good to see that you've seen the change. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that is important, I think. But also, but doesn't that take away a little bit from the traditions and stuff like that? Because if, if you're generally not... So if you're not paying... For, so generally, like, we've got... I've got a brother and then I've got a sister. So it's two brothers and sisters. So I understand if a family's got four daughters, mm. then it can be quite daunting. But then generally, don't... You know, you go to boys' size weddings, you go to girls' side, doesn't it kind of even out? Or what do you kind of think to that? I think... Whilst I think it's really important that for people who want to hold on to traditions, and you know, we know weddings are never one day, yeah, they're often yeah, like a week, a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and all the different ceremonies that take place. And some people actually really want to hold on to them. I've been to weddings when I've said, What is this particular ceremony about? and we don't know, we've just always done it. And but done, because yeah. it's always been done, yeah, people continue to do it. Yeah. Um, and that adds cost. I mean, you, you've got so much um, between, say, the the Mendy, the you know, the the actual Mendy's day, the wedding, the all juggle, the yeah. all the food, your, your house, or, or or you know, is open all the time, and you're constantly, constantly having people around. But you don't see these people every day. You don't see them maybe once a year. You see them in a couple of years. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So why are we up. trying to impress on yeah. them for this one occasion? Yeah. To say, haven't I done well? My daughter, my son has got yeah. married and they've had a great wedding. When all said and done, we're ignoring the two most important people in, in, in this, this show, yeah. which is the couple who are getting married. It, it just, you don't have to go through all yeah. of that to show that you've done well for your son or your daughter, yeah. I think. And if you strip it away, and if you just look at the way Sikhs and weddings are, is a non -degaran. it's just yeah. about that. It's not about any other rituals, yeah. even not even taking the girl to the boy's house, mm. not even doing the um, you know, Bani Vardhan or yeah. any of that. It, it's not about all these traditions, it's about the non but we've lost focus on that. And even if you look yeah. at it, 
half of your friends or family members won't even turn up to the Ananda Garden, but they're there at the party before. Yeah. So these at that start of that, buffet. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like get the best seats that they can at the reception. Yeah, yeah. It's sad because they've lost the originality and the organic process behind it, and yeah. I just think it's sad. And that's where I compare my parents' generation wedding yeah. to the weddings now in the book. Yeah. And there's a massive difference. No, there is. There is, definitely. Well, let's move on because you want to talk about dowry as well. Yeah. Can you explain what dowry is? Okay, so dowry means many things in different faiths and cultures, and it's something that crosses all communities, okay? But ultimately, dowry is an inheritance. Often the girl, um, upon her wedding, in trust for her, um, to her in-laws. Yeah. So... It, they have many, many different names for it, um, and, and particularly in Sikh, um, we, we often call it Sagan, okay, um, yeah. because you're giving a gifts and stuff. But you're not giving those gifts um, to like as as a wedding gift. It's not like a toaster or a, a photo frame. This is in trust for her that should anything go wrong. In the olden days, when women had their dowries, it would be gold bangles, and if the husband died or if something went wrong in that marriage, she could melt it down and then have some money to protect and, and move forward with herself and her children. Today, it's become this vast array of material goods, whether it's houses, designer products, um, cars, property, literally money, gold, all these things have now become more and more as part of this process. And ultimately, if that process of all these items are then being taken by one party and not given to the girl, then it's, it's financial abuse. So you're yeah. doing it not for the right motivations. And is it still happening quite a lot to this day? And it's, it's not just happening in our culture, it's quite a... It happens across all cultures. Yeah. So, I mean, we were just saying, if you think about in the Victorian days in, in England, yeah. right, a woman would only gain her inheritance once she got married. Right. Right? In many different cultures, in North Africa, in China, across the Middle East, all over the world, there is some form of transfer of goods for the wife, for the, for the girl, upon her wedding, yeah. for her own sort of long-term security. Yeah. So we know it's a historic thing, we know it's not a new phenomenon, and we know it happens across all cultures. And what is being done at the moment to change the dowry law? Right, well, we don't have a law in this yeah. country yeah. about dowry, um, yeah. because dowry is seen as a cultural process right. um, and tradition. Um, we have our Matrimonial Causes Act, and the problem we have is that dowry isn't recognised under that. If somebody got divorced, it would be a case of, and it was a registered marriage, they'd have to get divorced and divide everything in half. Right. But it's not taken into account that dowry is not the same as wedding gifts. Okay, so what's been, what is happening at the moment in terms of how are you guys kind of moving this forward? Because I know you're kind of wanting to change this, aren't you? Yeah. So many of, one of the things that we're doing is raise, going to do, delivering talks and training and workshops within communities, within police forces, within the Crown Prosecution Service, yeah. within schools and colleges and universities, trying to raise awareness and have this conversation. When we have that conversation, we can then start to address what support is available yeah. if somebody is affected by these issues. So yeah. what do you, what kind of support can we do to help this make, make happen? Can we, is it just to encourage people to open up, I suppose? And well, if of... somebody's had their dowry taken from them, yeah. and they've been, for example, removed from the house, or, or um, visas been cancelled, whatever it might be, and the, the family have taken the dowry, we have lawyers in this country who specialise in dowry abuse. Okay. And so we've seen an increase in that. Right. And so what it means is that there is a legal redress that we are looking at to try and get that dowry back. Okay. And do you think attitudes and mentality to wedding costs and dowry are changing for the better or do you still think we have a long way to go what's your kind of i think it's changing there? but at the same time but not with the diary i think with that uh, there's a difference because if parents are giving something to the daughter i understand that as sagan but when people are asking for it i think they should be that's where you've got to put your foot down and say no we're not going to condone that kind of behavior yeah. and actually challenge it and that's where i think people are struggling with because they so desperately want to see their kids get married and then they'll hide it. Yeah. We shouldn't be doing that. If anything, it's forbidden, in, again, in Sikh, uh, Sikh of codism, codism, it's forbidden to give your daughter for dowry. But it seemed like a bride price, the price you put on your daughter. Yeah. Um, but actually, you know, when you do that, you are actually, in effect, selling your daughter to the highest bidder. 
It's horrible to think of it like yeah. that, isn't it? That's crazy. Look, well, I love what you guys are doing and I think continue on doing and hopefully it's a good step in the right direction. Um, but thank you, thank you very much for your time, thank for coming you. on the show. It's gonna be, you're going to be sticking around for the series, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, so I look forward to having you with us. I hope you guys enjoyed today's show of Untold British Asian Stories. Gabid and I will be back soon where we're going to be tackling the issue of divorce. I'll see you guys then.